you're at Oxford University. Mm. How hard has it been for you to access these studies? You've got a university library at your disposal. We've got eight experts working on this project at full tilt, and it's taken us to working at capacity to retrieve all these articles and critically appraise them. Even one of us alone would not have been able to do this study, let alone someone else outside somewhere like the University of Oxford. Um, Peter, do you want to just talk us around? You spent, you, you have probably looked at most websites. What sort of claims and how did you find the reference? Was it easy to find the material? Yeah, no, it was a real challenge. I mean, the websites are constructed very much for consumers to find the products and the, the advertisement, but, but very difficult to find information to support those products. And usually there are lots of the websites have sort of a forum or a blog for exercise or athletes to read more about products. And often through those, Articles you could ch uh, ch f often find some references that were of some value that indirectly linked back to the, the products, but often it was very indirect and very very challenging, and often took often half an hour to an hour for a website just to get all the information, just to extract it, and even to find it if it was there at all. So were you more likely to find somebody like an athlete endorsing a product, or were you more likely to find some evidence? Uh, I think there was generally always an athlete endorsing the products, and that was clearly the initial messaging on the homepage of a website was which athletes are supporting them. And there was often complete bios or complete homepages about athletes themselves endorsing the products and, and their particular favorite product that they use and why they use it. And so that was often, you know, there was abundance of that information, but a scarcity of the references behind it. And so we asked you to look at uh, the quality of the evidence to assess what's called its risk of bias. And what, how did you do that? What sort of features did you look for in the studies? So we used standard methods to, to appraise articles, looking at, depending on the type of study, if it was a trial, you look for things such as blinding or allocation concealment, and was it randomized? And so we'd go through, and if we could find the full text, which often took quite a bit of time, then going through it in detail to try and extract this information that, that we look for in all studies, independent of whether it's a sports product or a medication, and often looking for these particular pieces of information, which often took quite a bit of time, because it wasn't very well described or often bits were written in, in the discussion, they weren't in place in the methods, and often it, you know, it took going through it several times just to get the information and be confident that you actually were finding you know, the correct information. So why did you have a second reviewer look at all the um, data and the research that you extracted? So it's always important to have a second reviewer check the data extraction, because any, any individual that's doing something which takes a lot of work and effort can often make errors and make mistakes. And, and sometimes these, these are judgment decisions, so it's always important to have someone that's as skilled and as trained as you are to go over it independently on their own and for you to discuss it in person just to ensure there's any disagreements. Is that because there was an error or because there was a judgment and to make a decision on that? So I think it's always, it's to really ensure that you're being accurate and making the correct decision and that the information that you're putting forward is truly, you can be confident that that's what actually is there. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had this particular feature where we looked for significant sports outcomes, which was difficult to define, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. But uh, how did you, how easy was it to understand what the outcomes were and to extract that and see how meaningful or how that related to actual sports performance? It's actually quite tough because a lot of these studies tend to use what we call a surrogate. This is a sort of an in-between um, outcome that's not the thing that we think generates good performance. So it's not like running quicker or lifting a heavier weight. It might be something like a, a blood test or for the stuff that I was looking at, lots of muscle biopsies. Um, we don't quite know what the link is between what they might look like under a microscope or what chemicals it contains and whether someone runs quicker or whether someone can lift heavier weights. And a lot of the studies we found were looking at those things, i.e. the kind of the measuring blood levels of things rather than are these athletes actually performing better. So trying to understand what makes um, an athlete better at their job of being an athlete versus you know what's different about something that's going in their muscle that might have absolutely nothing to do with it. It's interesting, we also asked you to extract data on the limitations, trying to see whether people actually discussed the study design, whether they thought the study design was robust, and what did you find there? Well, we essentially found that most studies did not actually discuss the limitations of their design. So rather than think about what to criticise about the study or what should we be aware of as a, as, a, as a general reader looking at their research, what should we be sort of cautious of in interpretation, they were quite confident that their results 
essentially were, were the right thing. In other words, they found the answer by doing their particular study. And we obviously had quite a few concerns because we weren't sure if people were blinded, they may knew, know that they were taking these certain drinks or these certain supplements and might have been altering their performance because they knew what was going on rather than it was a true um, blinded study. Um, but very few people actually, very few of these researchers actually went into detail of what they thought could be a criticism of their studies. Um, I was very surprised. I, I did a very quick search for systematic reviews and found a number of sports systematic reviews yeah. very easily. But across all these magazine adverts and websites, not one single company used a systematic review in their, yeah. to back up their claims. Did that surprise you? It, it's surprising because usually in healthcare we rely on systematic reviews to f try and figuring out whether a new treatment works better than some old or different treatment. And that's become standard practice in healthcare. So it's very surprising with looking at these new interventions or treatments, these sports supplements and drinks, why there didn't seem to be any systematic reviews cited by these various advertisers. And, and we know systematic reviews exist. And, and in a couple of examples, within a few minutes, we find two or three high quality systematic reviews of sports drinks and sports supplements, which really provide a very definitive answer. Yet they were very rarely, if ever, uh, referenced or cited by these advertisers. Do you, do you have any, I mean, it's obviously crystal ball gazing, a bit of speculation, but why might they have not cited the systematic reviews or meta-analysis that exist? I think the systematic reviews can be hard to interpret for someone who's not um, skilled at interpreting these kind of literature. But, but you worry if, if you, 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 what, what I think we'd worry about is whether some of these advertisers are cherry picking particular studies which give them the answer that they want for their product rather than looking at the entire evidence out there which may or may not support that kind of product. So when I looked at my studies actually yeah. that they had these small sample sizes and why do you think that is and how does that affect the outcome? Yeah. So I think it's a really important question and something that you know I found striking looking at uh, looking at these because the studies are so small, this increases the um, the chance that when the study is done, there will be a positive outcome in any given time that you know that that the study happens. Another thing we found um, that's part of this is that very few of the studies uh, retested again and again the. Uh, interventions they showed. And that's one way of sort of getting around this um, small sample size issue is uh, to be able to see if was this just a chance effect where one time these studies maybe looked at six people um, and there may have been a positive effect but that may be just due to chance and studies that have a much larger sample size uh, are much less likely to have those effects due to chance. One of the things we found was that three out of every four studies didn't actually employ blinding. Now that's a uh, an issue that causes bias in the studies, but why is blinding so important? Blinding is very important because if an athlete's not doing anything and then you give him an intervention or a hurt intervention, they might go faster just because you gave them anything. It's called a Hawthorne effect. The effect of being in a trial, of knowing you're being watched. If you know your coach is watching you and gave you something that they say is supposed to make you faster or stronger, you're likely to go faster that, uh, for that trial in any case. So if you blind the athletes, you give some of them, let's say, a real sports drink, so to speak, another one, a fake one, a placebo sports drink that looks the same, that's indistinguishable to the naked eye. That's how you can really tell if the, for example, sports drink had an effect. To me, in many of the cases, that's a, a real reason for questioning the results of the studies. 